guys, welcome back, Mom and Dr. Jones, OBGYN and Mom24. Today we're going through a video from Real Families, a YouTube channel that did a docu-series on a few interesting pregnancy cases. We're going to do the first of three of those today. It was just such a shock. I wanted to mention something from a couple of videos ago. We had the little carrot incident that was accidental. In the last video, I put a purposeful Easter egg in that, and it was a little blue dinosaur, and it took about 24 hours, but Patricia commented asking about the blue dinosaur and I'm sending her something small in the mail for noticing the small things. So whoever's the first to comment on the small Easter egg in each video can send me their address and I will send you something small in the mail. If it gets too easy and you start fighting over it because everybody wants to be the first to find the Easter egg, then I'll have to make it harder. But today it's not that hard. First correct comment about the Easter egg in this video. I'll touch base with you. If you're new here, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. If you're not subscribed, hit that little subscribe button and let's just jump into OBGYN reacts to strange pregnancies. Three families desperately trying to bring babies into the world. Three incredible stories of strange pregnancies. April 19th, 2008, Dr. Imogen Montague has brought thousands of babies into the world, but she's never faced a delivery as bizarre as this one. High bar here. In the fall of 2007, Jane and Graham Jones are living in the country outside Plymouth. They're finally leading the life they've always dreamed of. But in October of that same year, Jane begins experiencing nausea and regular bouts of fatigue. I, I was thrilled to bet bits when Jane told me uh, she was pregnant again. Having been through two pregnancies, Jane is familiar with the routine. But one afternoon, while doing the laundry, she's caught off guard by a searing pain in her abdomen. At about 14 or 15 weeks, I started to get this real sharp pain that made me like double over. Okay, so somebody complaining of sharp pain at 14 or 15 weeks, things going through my head would be a miscarriage and that would generally be paired with bleeding or something along those lines. I would be worried about things that weren't related to OBGYN. So appendicitis, gallbladder problems, bowel problems, kidney stones can do that, potentially ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy that happens outside of the uterus. They didn't say if they did an ultrasound early on, so I don't know if that would still be on the list. You could see this just as a normal pregnancy finding of really significant round ligament pain, but you wouldn't want to blame it on that until you'd ruled out scary thing. Round ligament pain is where the uterus has basically two ligaments that connect it to the pelvic sidewall, and as the uterus grows and stretches, it kind of pulls on those ligaments just a little bit. And sometimes with movement or position change, you can have a sharp pain that happens. It's more common on the right than the left, but it can happen on either side. There's a lot of things that that could be, and they didn't give us a lot of information yet. So let's keep watching. And when I went to the doctors and explained this, they said, because I was older, 10 years older, that it was all my pelvic and all that readjusting. I just carried on day to day. Then at 20 weeks in, Jane's obstetrician, Dr. Imogen Montague, finds something troubling during a routine ultrasound. She didn't know why I had an enlarged placenta because I didn't have it on the other two pregnancies. And she said that I had to come in and be monitored just to check that the baby wasn't struggling. If there is an abnormal placenta, there is always the risk of subsequent development of um, complications that are life-threatening for the mother. I'm not gonna lie, I don't know where they're going with this. An abnormally large placenta is not something that I see as a finding often, and um, I'm sure there's case reports or something and information on how they measured this and what they're getting at with this, but that wouldn't be something that we see often as an abnormally large placenta causing problems. They said the baby was at the smaller end of normal. So if a placenta looked abnormal on imaging, the baby was measuring maybe a little bit small and they thought the placenta had calcifications or wasn't giving the baby good blood flow. Maybe they're worried that there's some sort of infection that's causing the baby to not grow well because the placenta has been infected. I'm not sure where they're going with this. But the enlarged placenta diagnosis still doesn't explain Jane's excruciating pain. The pain was just unreal. 
Then at 26 weeks, Jane is undergoing another ultrasound when Dr. Montague spots something new on the scan, something shocking. She said, I don't believe what I'm seeing. I can see your womb to the right hand side, tucked over here near your appendix. So what she's pointing at there, let me see if I can take a screenshot for you guys. The black in the front is the bladder and the kind of where her finger is at is the uterus. There's definitely not a 26 week baby in there. So this is either a baby that's outside the uterus or she has another uterus. Still don't know where this is going, but that's an empty uterus. And your baby isn't in the What looked like an empty uterus, I needed to get that diagnosis confirmed as soon as possible. She was amazed because she couldn't actually see a baby in the womb. This has quite serious implications. Wow, that's really crazy. Okay, so this person had been getting regular prenatal care and has a second trimester, what would be a viable gestational age fetus, which is implanted outside of the uterus. That is so incredibly rare. This is called an ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancies are maybe like 3% of all pregnancies, but out of that 3%, about 95% of those implant into the fallopian tube. And the fallopian tube isn't really stretchy. It doesn't have a lot of blood supply. And so fallopian tubes can't stretch around that to let the fetus grow. People usually present pretty early on with significant pain and or a ruptured tube that's causing bleeding. And that can be a life-threatening complication. In this case, we are far enough along that she has a 26 week fetus that now we're finding out is outside of the uterus. I can only think that the way that this would happen is that wherever it implanted outside of the uterus obscured the view of the actual uterus at those earlier ultrasounds. At 20 weeks, I could see how a 20 week size fetus and a placenta could obscure the uterus. So probably instead of having a really large placenta, this fetus has a placenta that's attached to the wrong thing and potentially even attached to the outside of the uterus or they can attach to the liver, to the bowel, to the abdominal pelvic wall, anywhere really. And the way that that happens is that the egg gets fertilized instead of going through the fallopian tube and to the uterus and implanting there. It either doesn't go anywhere and implants inside the fallopian tube, which is where fertilization occurs, or it goes the wrong way out the tube and implants somewhere in the pelvis. This is so extremely rare. We call it an abdominal ectopic pregnancy. This is associated with very high rates of maternal morbidity and mortality. When caught early, this is something that we usually recommend not continuing a pregnancy because that's extremely, extremely dangerous. At this point, at 26 weeks, I don't know what their recommendation is gonna be. For me, I would be seeking help from some of my uh, perinatology colleagues to decide what we wanted to do. That is insane. And I've seen this somewhere on Twitter recently and like in politics recently, like you can't move that to the uterus. It, it doesn't work like that. If a fetus is implanted in the wrong place, it is one extraordinarily dangerous and always considered life-threatening to the person carrying the fetus. And it too cannot be taken out and re-implanted somewhere. That removes the blood supply. You can't do that. It doesn't work like that. You have to treat that surgically by removing the ectopic pregnancy or medically by giving a medicine that will cause the ectopic pregnancy to resolve. At this point, the surgery that they're going to have to do is going to be like I'm having heart palpitations thinking about it. It will be extremely complicated. To confirm the diagnosis, Dr. Montague rushes Jane in for an emergency MRI. This is the almost normal, slightly enlarged uterus with a uterine cavity and the cervix down here and the baby's entirely outside. I don't know if those are the real MRI images. Like, I don't know if they belong to her, but that's definitely an accurate MRI for what they're describing. The baby wasn't in my womb and it was attached to my bowel. It was just such a shock. I just looked at Graham and I thought, what do I do? Jane's condition is called an abdominal pregnancy. It's so rare, there are less than 100 documented cases in the world that have ever made it to delivery. It lodged on top of her bowel and against her abdominal wall quickly forming a placenta through which the baby could get blood and nutrients. I've never seen anything like it before or since. I am terrified. Obviously, she's going to live. She's telling her story, but um, that is so scary. I don't even know how to react to this. That's just... 
This is very scary. This is a really scary complication. Because and rare. Super every rare. time the baby moved, he moved the placenta, was, which was ripping the lining of my bowel. Jean's intestine is in danger of being severely torn at any moment. The pregnancy now takes on a life or death urgency. There would be risk of bowel damage, massive hemorrhage. Hello, switchboard. And um, other life-threatening complications to Jane. And she said there would be a one in five chance of me and the baby dying. So yeah, it was pretty scary. I'm going to be very, very amazed if both mom and baby out of this situation without major morbidity. When a placenta separates after a delivery, it, it leaves an open wound essentially. So you have the placenta there and it's been implanted on the wall of the uterus. Baby is delivered and then the placenta separates and you have these very vascular beds that are open and can bleed very significantly. The reason most of the time that doesn't happen in normal vaginal delivery or c-section is because the uterus is a huge thick muscle and oxytocin makes the uterus contract down around it and that closes those vessels off to decrease bleeding really quickly after delivery but if the placenta is attached to the liver or the bowel or anything that's not a muscle like the uterus when it comes off those vascular beds are still going to be there and they don't have anything to contract down and make them stop bleeding and this isn't like you can just you know tie it off or make it stop bleeding this is massive active swift bleeding i've read a case report where they had an abdominal pregnancy that they left the placenta in you can do that and give a medicine called methotrexate to try to get the placenta to either completely reabsorb or to shrink down enough to where you can go back in at a later time and remove it with less maternal damage oh man this is just I would want to be in a level one trauma center with ability to do massive transfusion protocols for this patient. But despite the dangers, Dr. Montague knows that delivering now at 26 weeks could have equally dire consequences for Jane's baby. She wanted to push the pregnancy as far as possible. I aimed to deliver Jane to just under 34 weeks. I also had given her course of steroid injections to have the baby's lungs as mature as possible should a preterm delivery need to take place. Okay, so it sounds like they're going to try to expectantly manage her. I hope that they keep her in the hospital to do that because this is definitely not something that you have a lot of guidance on how to do that safely and could turn into an emergency situation at any moment. So they're giving her steroids, which are injections to help advancing the lung development of the baby more quickly that's usually the last thing to fully develop. And so one of the most common complications of extreme prematurity is severe respiratory distress. So they're trying to avoid that as much as possible in the event that they do have to deliver soon. So now we're two weeks later at week 28. I think I'm having this baby. I just can't describe the pain to anybody. It was just horrible, horrible. Fine, relax. At this stage, I thought, do I call an ambulance or shall I get Jane to Derriford Hospital myself? Fearing Jane could die while they wait, Graham makes the 50-mile drive to the hospital himself. I've just put my hazard warning lights on. And I just drove so fast as I possibly could without injuring any, anybody else. I can remember the hazard lights going on and us going 100 miles an hour. I think they should have called an ambulance. So I understand the like i i was afraid something bad would happen while we waited for the ambulance the flip side of that is it's a 50 mile drive you should be making that drive inside of an ambulance especially with a known complication which could cause massive hemorrhage then you have the ability to get iv access to give medications you have a medical professional taking care of you on that 50 minute drive if any of you out there ever experience anything like this just call an ambulance that's why that service exists there were 16 people in the theater that afternoon, so it was quite crowded. When we opened the belly, we could see the placental sac was in the mid-abdomen, attached to the back wall of the abdomen, under which you have your main blood vessels. These are blood vessels where if they are torn or burst, will cause catastrophic hemorrhage, which is life-threatening within seconds and minutes. Dr. Montague decides her only course of action is to separate the baby from the placenta itself. She'll then leave the placenta attached to Jane's bowel in the hope that her body will eventually absorb it. We had attempted to remove it 
that Jane would have died on the table and it would be much safer to leave nature to deal with that. This may very well be one of the case reports that I've read where they did that. The placental sac was very thickened and abnormal looking. With extreme precision, Dr. Montague carefully frees the baby from the placenta. Then the team moves quickly. I rapidly delivered the baby, clamping the cord and passing the baby to the neonatal team. Weighing only two pounds, two ounces, the tiny baby boy goes straight from Jane's belly to a plastic sandwich bag. Babies. Okay, I like that they called it a plastic sandwich bag. <laughs> it's not actually a sandwich bag. It's almost like a plastic blanket or a plastic sheath that you put the baby into after it's born. And we do this for extremely premature babies. Tendency to get really cold really quickly. And that can be very dangerous, it's bad for their circulation, it's bad for their brain, it's bad for everything. That does two things. It keeps their body temperature a little bit higher, but it also keeps them from being able to lose their temperature regulation through evaporation. So like when you are in a swimming pool and you get out and you're suddenly a lot colder because that water's evaporating off of you, the same thing happens when you come out of a 98.6 degree hot tub as a fetus and then into the world where it's not 98.6 degrees and you're not living in water anymore and that water starts to evaporate and your temperature goes down. Blood welling up from the placental sac and the base of the placenta. In fact, Jane is losing more than two pints of blood a minute, a rate doctors can barely keep up with. They race against the clock to get Jane's bleeding under control. Massive transfusion using central lines and multiple drips in the arm. Finally, after 40 nerve wracking minutes, Jane is stabilized. That's actually less time than I would have anticipated that that would take if she started having massive bleeding from that placental side. I don't know, it sounds like they just put pressure on it, tried to get it to stop. They didn't really go into the surgical details. A few hours later, the 37 year old mother holds her son Billy for the first time. I just couldn't stop crying because I had my little boy and he was absolutely fine. Billy, who's 12 weeks premature, is put in an incubator and kept in the hospital for 10 weeks. He was the size of Graham's hand. So very, very tiny. It could have been a very different story. We could have had both a stillbirth and a maternal death, which is always a tragedy. And I think it is a miracle. That was crazy. I have never personally seen anything like this. Everything that this doctor was saying is kind of what would go through my head as well. And I am just absolutely floored that both she and him are doing well. This is a miraculous story. Billy's a healthy, happy two-year-old. And though he'll forever be known as the miracle baby, he seems like just another welcome addition to the Jones family. One, two, no. <laughs> cannot believe it. He like is gonna throw the egg. That's so my child. I would be interested to hear what long-term effects this had for her because you can imagine that having your bowel with a placenta implanted on it could cause some major problems in the future. So and I understand most people are probably just interested in the outcome of the pregnancy and that is also super important, but I would like to hear just from a medical standpoint what they ended up doing with the placenta. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. If you like this shirt, you don't get to be offended by science. You can get yours on Teespring and the link will be below. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind and I will see you next time.